it's time for chapter 15. This book is getting so good. I can't wait to see what happens today. Ref makes tough call. Hmm. I wonder what that's going to be about. Let's find out. On the first Friday in December, the ninth edition of the Landry News was distributed. Over 370 copies. Sitting at his desk, Dr. Barnes read his copy carefully. And when he turned to page three, Dr. Barnes finally saw what he had been hoping for week after week. Smack in the center of the page was the article of his dreams, an article that should not have been printed in a school newspaper. And Dr. Barnes was sure that a majority of the school board would agree with him. A slow smile spread over his face and in his mind, Dr. Barnes began planning Mr. Larson's retirement party. Carol Landry was having the time of her life. The Landry News was growing and changing and she was keeping up with it. By the fourth edition, Joey had to print on both sides of the sheet. And from the fifth edition on, the Landry News had needed a second sheet of paper for section B. Kara had to plan each edition. She had to read every story and every feature. Plus she would help kids with their rewriting and revising. And on Thursdays, when Joey was assembling everything on the computer screen, Kara often had to cut articles or features that took up too much space. Kara also had to reject whatever she didn't think would be right for the Landry News. Christy wanted to start a gossip column called Hot Stuff about school romances, crushes, rumors, and who was going to be dumped. When Kara asked if the information in her column would always be true, Chrissy had agreed that private notes passed among friends was the best place for that kind of news. And when Josh wanted to start a weekly ranking for the best fifth grade athletes, Kara told him the list would have to include girls as well as boys. Josh decided to write a piece about ocean kayaking instead. With all she had to do for the newspaper, not to mention her other schoolwork, Kara was barely able to find each week to, time each week to write her own editorial. The editorial was always the last item in the paper. And by the fifth edition, that meant it went on page four. The front page of the Landry News was the general news and information page. The main news stories, a summary of school and town events, and a weekly homework countdown that listed upcoming fifth grade tests and project due dates. There was always a photograph. And if there was room, the front page also included the weekend weather prediction from the United States Weather Service complete with little drawings that Alan made of sunshine, clouds, droplets, or snowflakes. The second page was different advice and information columns that kept kids coming up with like this question and answer column about pets. So here's an example. Pets, You Bet by Carrie Sumner. Dear PYB, Pets You Bet. I have a, sorry, I'm gonna have to get my glasses. The print's a little smaller. Dear FYB, PYB, I have a cockatiel bird named Dingo, and all he will say is pretty bird, pretty bird, pretty bird, over and over again. I talk to him for an hour every day, and I've tried to teach him to say other words, but he isn't interested. No matter what I say to him, and no matter how many times I say it, all he says is pretty bird, pretty bird, pretty bird. It's driving me nuts. Any advice from crazy in Birdland? Dear Crazy, I think your bird is mad at you because you named him after an ugly Australian wild dog. He wants to make sure that you know he's a bird and a pretty one too. Try changing his name to Wingdink or Superbird or Flyer and see if that works. And if it doesn't, maybe you should think about exactly why you want to be talking to a bird in the first place. With deep concern, PYB. <laughs> Alan Rogers had started a column where he interviewed kids about their favorite foods and how they got their parents to buy them snack attack dedicated to life liberty and the pursuit of junk food by alan rogers ar so jj not his real name i hear you've perfected a way to get your mom to buy sugary cereal and pop tarts every time she goes to the store even if you're not there to beg for them sounds too good to be true can you tell us about it jj believe me it's true but it didn't happen overnight these things take time and planning ar what was the first step jj I asked my health teacher what meal is the most important one of the day. AR, but didn't you already know that answer? JJ, of course I knew. She would say breakfast 
And once she did, I went home that afternoon and told my mom that my health teacher said, the most important meal of the day is breakfast. AR, ah, you were laying the foundation, right? JJ, exactly. Then I skipped breakfast for the next three days. Mom tried to get me to eat, but I just said, I don't like anything we have in the house. AR, didn't you starve those mornings? JJ, I'd ask my friend Zizi, not his real name, to bring some toast to the bus stop for me, so I was okay. At the end of three days, I mentioned to my mom that I thought I might like some of those cocoa puffs and the chocolate and marshmallow pop tarts might be something I could eat too. The next morning, there they were, like magic, right on the kitchen counter. AR, well, JJ, that's certainly an inspiring story, and I know our readers will appreciate you sharing it with all of us. Now, don't any of you do that. There was a big review every week, a video game tips column, a best of the web listing, and a best TV movies of the weekend column. Since Christmas and Hanukkah were not that far off, there was a holiday countdown, a column listing the top 10 presents that kids on the red and blue teams were hoping for. Tommy read a lot, and when he was in fourth grade, he had started collecting slang expressions that he thought were funny. He eventually discovered that there were whole dictionaries of slang. He asked Kara if he could have a column about slang, and the editor-in-chief said okay, as long as everything in the column had a G rating. Tommy agreed, and a column called That Slang Thang was born. Section B, the second sheet of the Landry News, was a, hodge, was a hodgepodge. If there were some good columns that wouldn't fit on page two, they ended up in section B. There were two regular weekly comic strips and usually a cartoon or two, as well as short stories and vacation travel stories about places kids had visited, like the Grand Canyon or the Field Museum. There were poems and jokes, and Leanne had surprised everybody with a completely creepy mystery story that had a new installment every week. And then on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, Michael Morton came up to Kara after school at her locker and asked if he could give her a story that a friend of his wanted to have printed in the newspaper. Michael was a computer whiz, the kid who did the best of the web listing for the paper each week. He kept mostly to himself. Kara said, sure, Michael, I'd be glad to look at it. Kara stuck the sheets of the paper in her backpack, grabbed her coat and ran to catch her bus. Late that night, Kara remembered the story got it out of her book bag and lay across her bed to read it. It was only two pages written in ball point black ink. There were tons of cross outs and smears on each page and the writer had pushed down so hard with his pen that the backside of each sheet reminded Kara of Braille, the raised alphabet of blind people. There was no name at the beginning, just the title Lost and Found. The story began with this sentence. When I heard that my parents were getting divorced, the first thing I did was run to my room grab my baseball bat and pound all my little league trophies into bits. Kara was hooked. The person in the story was a boy and Kara was amazed at how similar his feelings were to the ones she had when her dad had left. The same kind of anger, the same kind of blind lashing out. And finally, there was the same sort of calming down, facing facts. The story did not end very hopefully, but the boy saw that life would still go on and that both his dad and his mom still loved him just as much, maybe more. When Kara finished reading, she was choked up and her eyes were wet. She noticed that there was no name at the end of the story either. That's when it hit her, that this was not fiction. It was real life. It was Michael Morton's own story. Kara slid off her bed and went out into the living room, drying her eyes on the sleeve of her robe. Her mom was on the couch watching the end of a show. So Kara sat with her for about five minutes. When the show ended, Kara picked up the channel changer and shut off the TV. Then she handed her mom the story. Would you read this for me, mom? Someone wants me to put it in the next edition of the newspaper. Joanna Landry took off her glasses and said, why sure, honey, I'd love to. Kara watched her mom's face as she read and she saw her mom's eyes fill up with tears when she got to the end. Blinking back her tears, her mother turned toward Kara on the couch and said, if I didn't know better, I would have thought this sad little story was about you, Kara, honey. I think it's awfully good, don't you? Kara had brought a copy of each edition the Landry News home, and Mrs. Landry had proudly taped them all on the wall in the kitchen. She was thrilled to see Kara doing something so good and good-hearted, enjoying herself and using her talents. Handing back the smudged pages, her mother asked, so are you gonna put it in the paper? Kara said, I'm not sure. I think I better talk to Mr. Larson about it. 
and after the long Thanksgiving weekend, Kara had her mom drop her off at school early so she could show the story to Mr. Larson before school. Mr. Larson adjusted his reading glasses and took the pages over by the windows where the light was better. Three minutes later, he was finished and his eyes were shining. This boy has certainly caught the essence of a hard experience here, he said, reaching for his handkerchief. Kara nodded and said, so maybe I shouldn't put it in the newspaper, right? Mr. Larson looked down at the story again. Then he handed it back to Kara. Tell me what you think about it, Kara. Kara was quiet while Mr. Larson walked over to his desk, sat down and picked up his coffee cup. Well, first of all, she said, I'm just sure this is a true story. So it's like telling the whole school about some family's private business. Someone might not like that, like the mom or the dad, for instance. Divorce is a pretty messy subject, don't you think? I mean, that part about him running away and the police coming and everything? Kara paused, waiting for Mr. Larson's reaction. He took a sip of coffee, looked out the window, and then back to Kara's face. You said you are sure this is a true story? Is it trying to hurt anyone? Kara shook her head and said, no, in fact, it really helped me. And then she blushed at what she'd said. Mr. Larson pretended not to notice and quickly said, well, it helped me too. So I should put it in the newspaper, right? Said Kara. Mr. Larson said, I appreciate your talking to me about it, but that's a decision that the editor in chief should make. I will say whatever you decide to do, I will support you completely. Four days later, the first Friday in December in the middle of page three of the ninth edition of the Landry News, there was a story by an anonymous writer a story called Lost and Found. It was the same story that Dr. Barnes was so excited about. Nothing to post today. I can't wait to read what happens next.